All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Mr. Jason. I'm one of the RIQ systems instructors here in the squadron. I'm currently in uh, RPAC, which is the R RPA Next uh, development course, and uh, I'm still attached to RIQ. So I am available to be your instructor for this particular class all the way through Systems 1 and Systems 2. Uh, some of the events that you'll have, such as the aircraft tour and walk around, which will be right after this, the academic exam and maybe uh, a class or two, I will not be your instructor for due to scheduling conflicts. But I'll be your primary systems instructor. So welcome to RIQ if you haven't heard that already. A uh, little background on myself. I'm a B-1 pilot by trade. I started out in the Air Force as a civil engineer. Any engineers in here? OK, so I got to remember where my smart folks are. Um, yeah, I did that for four years. I was at Hill Air Force Base. I was in environmental, so I ran the uh, industrial water treatment facility there. And uh, I oversaw a $5.2 million MILCOM project. So for the second lieutenants in here, definitely that was uh, something to behold, giving me that much responsibility. I didn't mess it up, although I did almost get fired twice. But uh, they said, hey, you're, you're too good to be here, so you're going to go to pilot training. So um, I went to pilot training. I did uh, B1s for 12 years. In between my uh, B1 assignments, I was a T-37, which was the predecessor to the T-6. And then I was initial cadre at Laughlin in the T-6. So I've got about 1,000 hours in the T-6. I've got about 4,000 hours overall, nine deployments, and uh, over 1,000 confirmed enemy killed in action. So if you are one of those MQ-9 folks, like, I'm not sure if I want to kill the bad guys, come talk to me, and I'll uh, let you know all about uh, what it's like to do God's work. So uh, just some admin before we get started. Does everyone have an electronic training device, an iPad? Does everyone have one? Sometimes they run short, and uh, I just wanted to make sure everyone had one. The way the course works is I see some of you have the paper courseware. It's not required. Some of you like to take notes. A notebook is probably preferable, like a spiral ring and your ETD. So the courseware itself, the T6 Systems courseware, it supplements the readings out of the dash one. Now, if you haven't had an opportunity, does everyone know where the dash one is? The owner's manual for the T6 in your ETD? Does everyone know where that is? Thumbs up? Nobody? You don't know where it is? OK, so everyone pull out your ETD. If you don't, uh, if you don't have it, look on with somebody else. So under your good reader, does everyone know how to get to the good reader? OK. So under good reader, RIQ publications, tap that. You'll see flight and ground. Go to the ground tab. And then at the very bottom of that, you'll see T6. At the very bottom of that, you'll see tech order dash 1T dash 6A dash dash 1. Okay? That is your dash 1. That is basically your owner's manual for the T6. That's where the primary source document for all of the systems discussions that we're going to have. So when you get to the beginning part of the objective lesson, um, it's going to talk about what the reading assignment is for that particular area. For example, you got propulsion. Obviously, you're going to be talking about the engine system. So go to those pages in the dash one to supplement what's in your CBTs and your courseware readings. Does that help? OK, good, because there's a lot of students that go through, and they, all they look at is the, um, the, the, the follow-along guide, and they don't actually go to the source document. Go ahead. So, sir, is that where you would find some information for the embedded questions? I noticed some of these answers weren't in this initial material. So is that what those? It'll, it'll go in the reading assignment. So, and it also will augment in the, in the CBT reading. Good question. OK, that being said, all of the podium instruction that you're going to receive from the instructors augments what's in the CBT. What does that mean? All of the testable material is in your CBTs. So it behooves you to spend that time going through over in the uh, training lab or at your house or whatever, going through that material. Now, I know there are students that go, oh, i got to get this done. Click, 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 and they get all the way through it. That's fine. I'm not against that. However, at some point, you will be responsible for that reading. 
So during your crew duty day, go back over to the CAI lab, spend the due diligence and time to go through it. I promise you, if you do that, you'll be largely successful on the exam. If you don't do that, you were warned. Uh, the other thing is crew duty day. I kind of touched on it. Who knows what crew duty day is? Anybody? What is it? It's that time, that time where you can actually be working and flying and you have 12 hours in between. Did everyone hear that? It's your 12 hour duty day. It's the time you can be doing official work stuff. So what that means is if you're doing CBTs for credit, if you are attending class, if you are doing anything that's work-wise related, it has to be within a 12 hour window. What I'm saying is if you get here at 6 a.m. and you start doing your CBT lab at 6.30 that night for credit, that is going to be a syllabus deviation and your training will be halted until we get that rectified. So please do not do that. Now, that being said, if there's something you want to review or study or get together in groups and it's 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, that's your time, okay? Just make sure you get adequate rest. Does that make sense? You can only do official business for 12 hours on the flight line. All right. So that being said, this is the 50,000 foot introduction to the T6 and its systems. What that means is we're just going to cursory go through what you're going to be responsible for in this particular block of training. Okay. Any questions before we get started? All right. Like I said, this is the introductory overview for the T6. We're not going to get down in the weeds. We're not going to talk about spray bars on the, on the, uh, turbine section of the aircraft, none of that stuff right now. Okay, we are just gonna talk about the T6 in general. That's what it looks like. Some of you have probably driven by the west flight line and seen them parked under the sunshades or watched them fly around in the pattern. That's what you're gonna be flying. Tandem cockpit, T6 with a turbo prop on the front. Yes, we're gonna talk about all these things, but like I said, at that higher level and not with the fidelity that you're going to get broken out in each and every subsequent lesson. All right, pri primary flight controls. It's direct control to the aircraft. It's not like a hydraulic assist. So if you move the control stick, it's got a series of plumb bobs and pulleys that physically move that control surface. So the control stick controls your ailerons around the roll axis. The Control stick also controls the elevator, which is the pitch axis, and then your rudder pedals control the yaw axis. Now, I will tell you that the courseware uses these terms interchangeable. In one sentence, it might say yaw. The other one, it might say the vertical axis. So just keep in mind that those terms are interchangeable. Elevator for pitch, and like I said, that's with the control stick as well as the ailerons. Obviously, with these being interconnected, if this one goes up, this one goes down. And that's for the roll axis. And then obviously, you've got the rudder for the yaw or vertical axis. The aircraft ha it does have a gust lock. All that does is it locks the rudder pedals and the control surfaces in place during gusty wind or windy conditions so that the the flight surfaces don't slam back and forth. Obviously, that has to be removed before flight. That would be self-critiquing. You can't move the control stick or the rudder pedals. Secondary flight controls, what are those? What do we call them as pilots? Trim. So those help relieve the stick forces and allow the aircraft to fly coordinated flight without any kind of additional input. If you're flying slow and you're holding the nose of the aircraft up, to maintain the AOA, you're going to get fatigued, some of you more than others. Okay, So um, to lessen those forces, we have flight, flight control surfaces. The secondary flight controls are trim to help offset that. We've got the elevator trim. There is a trim tab located on the actual elevator. And then that deflects, and then it lessens those forces. Same with the rudder. This whole entire surface back here is the rudder, but that is the trim tab. The aileron trim, what's it pointing at? Is there a trim tab? Did anyone do any reading? No? Okay. So for the ailerons, the entire aileron is trimmed. 
Now the amount of trim that the aileron can accept is still less than the full travel of the aileron to still give you lateral control. But the whole surface for the aileron trim is trimmed. That's pretty important. I'd remember that. When I say that, does everyone know that's kind of like a foot stomper or something really important to kind of either circle or remember? And then there's the rudder trim tab. The rudder trim tab not only takes rudder trim inputs from the pilot, but what we have on the T6 is called a TAD, a trim aid device. Now this courseware says it gives the aircraft a jet-like feel. Because the T-37 was a dual engine jet aircraft, the Air Force wanted the T-6 to fly like a T-37 or any other kind of jet. So what it does is when you have high, well, I'll go to the, go to the build. It'll make more sense. Oh, it's not there. The trim, the trim aid device takes in your altitude, your pitch rate, your airspeed, all of those things, and it adjusts the, tr the rudder trim to compensate for the yaw created by the propeller out front of the aircraft. So the Navy has the T-34 or had the T-34, and that did not have that system. So when they added a lot of power, the nose of the aircraft would pull dramatically to the left. The T-6 still does that, but not to the degree that the T-34 did. So it dampens that out by taking those inputs and putting in the right amount of rudder trim. That's all it does. The aircraft flies fine without the TAD. It just lacks a little bit of coordination that the pilot has to be Johnny on the spot to compensate for. And like I said, when we get to the secondary flight controls or the flight controls less than itself, we'll go into that in a, in a lot greater detail. All right, we'll start with, we'll start in the back with the class leader. We'll start with him. Which control service controls the aircraft movement around the pitch axis? The elevator. Yeah, the elevator. So that controls it in the pitch or lateral or yeah, lateral axis. The trim aid device assists trimming for what surface? Go to the next person. Rudders. Yeah, the rudder trim tab. This was the build I was looking for. So these are the inputs that the TAD uses. Again, we'll cover, cover this many times. All of those four items are important. So airspeed, altitude, pitch rate, and torque. Those are the things that the TAD takes into account and then adjusts the rudder trim tab appropriately. All right, that's the flight controls in a nutshell. All right, the propulsion system. We're pilots, what do we call it? We don't call it propulsion. Where's my engineers? What do we call it? Yeah, no. What do we call it? The propulsion system. What is it? The motor. The engine. Yes, the engine. Okay, real quick. The T6, the PT6A engine, is a turbojet engine. Turbo, uh, turbojet, okay? The jet itself, the jet engine, is mounted backwards from a con conventional jet engine that you would have on like a 737 or something like that. So the air comes underneath and into the starter generator and flows through the aircraft through the compression, combustion, and turbine section and then out the exhaust port. So it's a reverse flow engine. The thrust generated from the engine goes into the uh, power section and turns the propeller. So it's not intuitive. It's not like your F-86 engine, okay? It's reverse flow. But it provides thrust to propel the aircraft through the air. It gives us our thrust, like you said, Mr. Engineer. What else does it do? It doesn't just do that. What's your car have on your engine? It's got a bunch of belts, right? Air conditioning compressor and your alternator and your power steering unit and your power brakes and all that stuff, okay? Well, guess what? T6 does the same thing. 
It's got a hydraulic pump, two engine-driven fuel pumps, an oil pump. So all of those are mounted in the accessory section right up here on the front part of the engine. And they're driven by the engine as well. So not only does it provide thrust to move us through the air, but it powers all of those accessories that are on the accessory drive. Good. All right, the hydraulic system. Very, very basic hydraulic system in the T6. There's only five things that the hydraulic system controls. The landing gear, extension and retraction, the inboard gear doors, which you can see here. These are the inboard gear doors. The outboard gear doors are physically connected to the gear. So on the arm of the landing gear, when the outboard gear doors want to come down, the inboard gear doors open to get out of the way, and then this is connected to the strut and it comes down. So these inboard gear doors are hydraulically operated as well as the landing gear. And that's all that's saying. Additionally, the flaps. You're going to see that on the walk around. Take note here, you can see that there's a small split in the flaps. That's because of the dihedral on the wing. The wing comes out straight and then it bends up. Well, the flaps, they go the length of about a third of the wing. So they have to split because of that dihedral change. These are in the full landing position. So the landing gear, the main inboard gear doors, the flaps, the speed brake, this is a good picture of it. Normally in the hangar, they don't have the speed brake down because the flaps are down. Can't have the speed brake and flaps down at the same time. But this is a good depiction of what it looks like. and then nose wheel steering. We normally don't use differential braking even though it's a capability in the aircraft. We normally don't taxi around unless we have the ability to use nose wheel steering. So those are all of the systems that are operated on the hydraulic system. Notice brakes are not on here. Who's a maintainer? Crew chief, maintainer, anybody? Former, okay. Normally I have one and they're like, well, what about the brakes? The brakes are a completely separate system and we're going to talk about that at a later date. Please don't miss that on the exam. Electrical. The T6 is a battery operated airplane. Now there are some transformer rectifiers and uh, transducers that convert DC to AC for certain components, but it is really primarily a DC aircraft. That being said, the primary electrical system for the aircraft is a starter generator. That is the primary power source. What's the primary power source for the T6? Uh, starter generator. Did everyone hear that? OK. The starter generator is the primary power source. The secondary power source would then be the, the battery. And then in the event that there's some sort of electrical malfunction or failure mode, we do have the capability of using the auxiliary battery. There is an external receptacle that you guys will see on your walk around. Over on the left hand side of the aircraft, there's a small access door. It has a little butterfly uh, clasp on it. If the uh, guy that's giving you the tour opens that butterfly valve and you look, that's what it looks like. It's just a, it's a, a plug-in, all right? So it'll accept any uh, normal DC 24 volt cart uh, application. We don't normally use that um, unless you're out on the flight line doing the first start of the day. In the Sims, we normally don't have that capability, but that's just something that you need to be aware of. So those are our electrical sources for the T6. Normally, the generator has enough power to power everything. Like I said, it's the primary power source. It gives a tertiary charge to the battery. Battery is used for engine start, kind of like in your car. The aux battery normally isn't used unless you physically turn it on. And then, like I said, the external power. We don't have the capability in the sim. It only exists on the flight line. All right, the fuel system. What's it do for us? 
Well, that's pretty obvious. It stores all the fuel. What else does it do? It distributes the fuel where? Where does the fuel eventually need to go? To the engine. Very good. Okay. So we've got two wing tanks with Venturi flow transfer pumps and a main center collector tank that feeds the engine. Goes up through the fuel filter, low engine pressure pump, high engine pressure pump, through the fuel flow regulator, and then to the engine. It's a very straightforward system. The uh, engine data manager manages all the fuel balancing, and it's an extremely reliable system. There's not much more to the fuel system. It feeds the engine to sustain engine operation. And then, like I said, through the engine data manager, it keeps the fuel automatically balanced. This isn't your grandfather's B-52, okay, where you're flipping switches to keep all the fuels balanced. It's all done automatically. And we've got ways that we can fix that if that automation fails. Yeah, the wings don't feed the, the engine. Very good. Yeah, all of the fuel flows from the wings to the collector tank, from the collector tank through the lines up to the engine. Very good. Thanks for that. Any questions on that? OK. OK, I just glossed over that slide. That reminds me of another admin thing. And you guys are going to like this and appreciate it. If there is any reference to the ejection system, ejection seats, canopy, uh, parachute system, all of that, the environmental system, or the traffic avoidance system, you're not responsible for any of that. No environmental, no traffic avoidance system, no canopy, no ejection system, period, dot. Because that all deals with someone being in the airplane. The beauty is you're not going to be in an airplane. Your RPA pilots, you're sitting in a comfy lazy boy, kicking back and burning the bad guys up. Okay, or breaking their stuff. I have to be politically correct. All right, where did I leave off? Did I leave off with you? All right, true or false, engine exhaust augments the propeller thrust. True. Yeah, but it's not much. Sir, how much does it do? I don't know, 15 pounds of thrust, maybe. It's just because the exhaust acts come up. Bless you. You got a fever? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you got it. And the thrust is angled backwards. Okay, so it comes out of those ports that I showed you on the cutaway view of the engine, but it's directed backwards. Well, that would make sense. If you had the exhaust coming out and blowing this way, it's just it's slowing you down in effect. So it does, but not to any great deal. Primary aircraft electrical power is provided by which component? Starter generator, very good. We call it the starter generator because it does both things. Until the engine is up to speed, it's working as a starter. And once it's up to speed, if you turn on the generator switch, now it's going to run as a generator. And that's what it looks like. It looks like a gold Folgers can on the front of the engine for those that drink coffee. All right, communication system. We have two radios in this airplane. We have a UHF radio and a VHF radio. We have two ways to operate the UHF radio. We can operate it with the RMU, or radio management unit, or we can use the backup UHF control head. VHF has to be controlled by the RMU. We have a transponder, so you can do your, do your squawk code. Unlike DOS, where you guys squawk 1200 all the time because you're VFR. And then we have a VHF nav section down here where you can tune in ground base stations. We have an intercom panel, which is cockpit selectable. So if you really want to listen to the ident to a uh, nav aid, and I don't, excuse me, I can deselect that. And you can listen to the beeping all day long. And the intercom system allows us in a tandem cockpit, it's vital that we can communicate with each other. So. It's usually defaulted to the hot mic position so that the instructor and the student can converse without having to key the radio. B1, you couldn't do that. You had to key 
the intercom switch to talk to everybody, which was in the down position, which when I came back to the T6 was a little bit negative transfer. So I'm constantly yelling at my instructor or yelling at my student talking on the radio, which was problematic when you're in the pattern. But I'll save that for another day. All right. The emergency locator transmitter, this is when the Marines go out and fly. No offense, guys. But we want to be able to find the wreckage or find the aircraft after it impacts the ground. So there is a emergency locator beacon located back here in the plastic cover, if you will, back here on the empennage. And it will sense a deceleration, a crash. OK. Sorry, I had to pick on you guys a little. Thanks for being here. All right, the VHF nav, I just touched on that briefly when we talked about the radio management unit. It's this field down here that allows us, in this case, we've got a VOR station selected to navigate off of. So we do have VHF navigation. We also have a DME associated with it. So if you are able to receive a DME either from a TACAN using VOR frequency pairing, which I'm not going to discuss because I'm not a nav or instruments instructor, thank God. I'll leave that for them. But you have DME capability as well. So you can do VHF navigation and DME, as well as GPS. Now, Air Force, Big Blue, and Navy got together, and they're like, we need a GPS for the airplane. So instead of going out and buying an off-the-shelf Garmin 540 or 480 or something cool or a G1000, they went, hmm. Kalen 900. Ooh, 900. That's a big number. That must be better than the other two. Wrong. They were wrong. OK. It is IFR certified for flight, so you can use our GPS. It's just not that user friendly. And you guys will figure that out when you start using it. You'll go, oh my god, i got to pull out a knob, click, cursor, click, 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 scroll, cursor, click, and I just put in one number. It's just it's not intuitive. It doesn't have a keypad. But it is IFR certified. So we do have that for navigation. So we have ground-based navig, uh, VHF navigation with DME. And then we have a GPS. Those are typically the ways that we use uh, the navigation systems. The AHARS, or Attitude Heading and Reference System, it'll always be enslaved. The only time you would use direct gyro is going over the North Pole. All right, the fl primary flight instruments, artificial horizon or EADI electronic attitude display. Most people just call it the ADI, or they can use the term EADI. That's what it's going to be called. This is your horizontal situation indicator, your navigational piece. It's the HSI. Then you've got the airspeed altimeter and VVI, which is VSI, vertical speed indicator versus vertical velocity. I don't know. I didn't name it. I would use VVI, but it's VSI. OK. So those are your primary flight instruments. E EHSI, or horizontal situation, I already talked about that. Airspeed, altimeter, vertical speed. Your standby instruments, they're located on this row down here. And don't forget, the mag compass is also part of the standby instruments. Is the mag compass part of the standby instruments? Yes. Please don't miss that. OK, it's very important. These are your standby instruments to include the mag compass. They're normally powered, the ones that need power, off of the battery bus. In the event of some sort of electrical malfunction, they are also powered by the aux battery. So there is some redundancy in the system there. But it also has an airspeed indicator, attitude indicator, altimeter. It's got the turn and bank indicator, as well as the whiskey compass or mag compass. Go ahead. We have two, yeah. We've got the, the primary airspeed indicator, and we've got the standby airspeed indicator. It's just that important. Same with the altimeter. We have a standby as well as a primary ADI as well. Go ahead. Uh, what is the main difference between, or what is the difference between the attitude indicator and the electronic attitude director indicator? There there's, there's not much. And I don't really want to go into too much detail about all the laser gimbals and the things that are associated with the EADI. But the electronic one is a lot more accurate than your 
gyroscopic EADI. They work similarly by keeping the aircraft horizontally situated, but the, all you need to know is that they're both powered independently of each other. So the information on this should match this generally, but they're not du duplicative. Yes, sir. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Is your EHSI when you track the radio or whatever? Or yes, okay. it's our navigation okay. piece. Any other questions? Those are good questions. Primary navigation is provided on which component, since you brought it up, which, which one is it? Navigation is on what display? EHSI. It's the one down here. Which standby flight instruments will operate without electrical power? Pretty close, yeah. On the turn slip, the ball portion will work without power as well. And what you'll see is when I go to the build, it highlights that. On the ADI, if it's not powered, a little red off flag will come into view. And on the turn indicator up here, there's a little blacked out circle. There's a red dot that it'll appear. If you guys can see that over there. So the items that are not powered, you'll see either an off flag or the red dot. This will work for a little while. It'll work for nine minutes, and then it'll start to precess. But that's pretty good that most of our standby stuff will work without power. So if we lost power, the battery bus failed, how could we power the standby instruments? Aux battery. But we'll cover that when we get to the electrical section. Not responsible for any of that. Summary. Okay. Like I said, that was pretty much the 30, 40,000 foot level. Let's just spend a couple of minutes talking uh, briefly about where you're gonna, how you're going to do the next uh, block of training, the Systems 102. And then I would just want to give you some philosophy on completing your CBTs. Does everyone have their, go ahead, do you have a question? Oh. Does everyone have their 15-day training sheet? We'll try to adhere to the schedule on this pretty close. If there's like a high demand on Friday and we got an afternoon CBT or afternoon instructor-led discussion, if everyone can get stuff done, you guys can work with me to, to, to plan that. But we're going to stick to this training flow fairly accurately. Okay, so the most important thing is uh, after this class, you guys are going to meet out here in the foyer and you're going to get with Mr. Copeland and Mr. Eric and they're going to take you over to the aircraft hangar. It's kind of raining, so if, hopefully everyone's got a jacket. Uh, carpool if you have to, to go over to the hangar, but it's going to be at the hangar at the end of the gym. So the road that the gym is on, there's a hangar there, hangar 41, I believe. Anyway, uh, you guys will walk over there and they'll get your aircraft tour. Take advantage of it. It's kind of the cursory view to kind of see what I just went over slide-wise and kind of physically uh, touch the aircraft. So you can kind of get an appreciation of what we're talking about here. That being said, tomorrow you guys have uh, instructor-led discussion. Oh, sorry, after the uh, systems walk around, uh, it's probably going to take the full hour just with the transit involved. When that's complete, you guys are then opted for your CBTs. The key takeaway on this is you can get them all done from one to about three, or you can go have an extended lunch and get them done. Just don't be in the building completing them past 7.30 tonight. Does that make sense? Because you have instructor-led discussion at 7.30 in the morning. Now, some of you I know are early risers, like, whoa, what if I come in at 5 a.m.? 5 a. Um, our academics shouldn't go beyond that, but remember, you can't the following day be in the building past five. So the bottom line is, and most of the instructors will tell you this, we don't care when you get your CBTs done. 
two things are required. One, you have to do it in your crew duty day, and you have to get them done by the next academic lesson. If you don't get them done by the next academic lesson, then you'll be meeting with a flight commander like Captain Valley. And look at how mean she is. Look at that mean face, OK? You don't want that. That being said, some of you need doctor's appointments, medical appointments, uh, follow-up appointments, dental appointments. Try to do those during the CBT portion and not the instructor-led discussion. No instructor likes to teach systems or a class more than once, especially me. I'll give you my angry eyes off the Mr. Potato Head if you guys skip my instructor-led discussion. Okay, it's just very important. If you can help it, try to do that. If you're sick, you're running a fever, don't come here. Do not get the rest of us sick. Call your class leader. He'll pass that information on to me and the other flight commanders.